On June 25th, Women's Rights Without Frontiers co-hosted a panel at the United Nations Human Rights Council in Geneva, Switzerland. The panel was entitled, Abandoned in China, Baby Girls and Abandoned Widows. According to the report, the two most vulnerable groups of females in China are baby girls whose mothers are pressured to abort or abandon them, and elderly widows. Now, widows are exponentially increasing over all over the world, but the rising number of poor, destitute widows has been quite invisible, especially in China. In a society that continues to favor males, baby girls and elderly widows are often considered a liability. My next guest addressed the UN panel in Geneva this week. Joining us from Houston to talk about her testimony is the president of the Women's Rights Without Frontiers, Reggie Littlejohn. Reggie, thanks for being here. Thank you so much for having me, Raymond. Now, according to one UN estimate, there are more than 20, 200 million women and girls missing in the world because of sex-selective abortions and abandonment. Now, that number, 200 million, is greater than all the casualties of all the wars of the 20th century combined. I want to start with the widows in China. You've blamed China's one-child policy for the abandonment of widows in China. How is that connected? Well, this is one of the many horrible, unintended consequences of the one-child policy, which is that historically, traditionally, elders have been venerated in China, and couples in the countryside would have a, a very large family, and then when they got old, they would have this large family to support them. And that's what they had instead of Social Security. Now, because of the one-child policy, the family structure in China has been completely decimated, mm. and these window, widows are finding themselves completely alone mm. and abandoned and destitute. And, you know, for example, one of the widows that we are supporting, she only she had, didn't have enough money to eat every day, so some days she only ate salt. And she bought herself a rope to hang herself with when life just mm. got too tough. And senior suicide has been skyrocketing in China because of the abandon, not only of the widows, but of all elderly. According to statistics of the U.S. State Department, about 590 women a day kill themselves in China. And senior suicide rates, as you mentioned, they've risen 500 percent in the last 20 years. Seniors killing themselves has become normalized. It's, 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 it's considered a, an honorable way to go, correct? That's right. And it's really... Really heartbreaking, Raymond. There's in one of my widow, one of the widows that we're supporting, when her husband got sick, their daughter-in-law came to them and actually yelled at them, saying, "What? You know, basically, she went around to the neighbors saying, why don't they just die? Why doesn't he just die?" And she pointed out uh, another widow or another woman in in the um, area when she found out that she had breast cancer, she went and hanged herself mm. on the tree in the backyard so that her family would not have to pay the medical expenses. Mm. And she was holding this up as an example for the wid widow that we're supporting and her husband of what they should do so that, that their family would not become homeless. That's the word that she used. Wow. Is there any awareness among the Chinese regime where this two-child policy has led and the consequences to their society? Yes, I think that there is a lot of awareness there, and that's why they moved from a one-child policy to a two-child policy. They didn't do it as a, a form of reparation or, or because they're sorry for all the forced abortions, like f hundreds of millions of forced abortions that they have committed. That wasn't the reason. It was not mm -hmm. having to do with human rights. It it's having to do with a senior tsunami that is about to hit China because they don't have enough young people to support their rapidly wow. aging population. Mm. Now, you've been campaigning to save girls for years. Why is it relatively difficult to muster the same support for saving widows? You know, this is very interesting because the same network that has been saving girls for years in China, we, I noticed these elderly widows and I wanted to help them. And when you say save the baby girls, there's this big... Everybody wants to do that. And when you say save the widows, there's like no, a very small response. And I, I think that it's because people want to, to save babies because these are the future. And when you're dealing with widows, you're dealing with somebody who, if you save her, in other words, if you give her support so that she can eat every day, you're, she's never going to become an economically productive member of society. Her years as a wife and a mother are o over. So to me, this is the test of how much we actually care about the dignity of the person. If we're willing to support someone as they go from this life into the next, 
even though they're not going to become a, a productive member of society, but at least they will die knowing that somebody cares about them and not die of starvation or suicide. Mm -hmm. When we look at China and India, R Reggie, um, men outnumber women by 70 million. In China, they That's outnumber right. women 30 to 40 million. This imbalance is the driving force behind human trafficking and sexual slavery, uh, not only in China, elsewhere as well. What's being done to combat this problem, this scourge? Oh, well, not hardly anything, according to the, the recent tip report that came out just mm -hmm. last week. Uh, trafficking in per per persons report rated China as a tier three nation for the third time in a row. And what that means is that they are a major destination um, and origin of trafficking, and they are not, the, the government is not doing enough to, to stop it. And there is evidence both in China and in India of actual complicity of the government with traffickers. So, yeah. you know, you think that there's 30 or 40 million more men than women living in China today. Right. And uh, I, I think that the, that the government probably thinks, oh, my gosh, if we stop the trafficking, we'd have an insurrection on our hands. And so they just look the other way. It's unbelievable. And I guess that's how they're dealing with the fact that you've got 24 million Chinese men of marrying age that don't have spouses. They can't find spouses. So I, I, I suppose trafficking is their answer. Yeah, and there's, there's very terrible situations where women are lured to come to China saying, oh, we're going to get you a great job. You'll be able to send money home to your family or whatever. And then they get to China and the men who marry them have to pay these enormous fees to the traffickers. And mm. then what they do is they actually rent the women out, at, their wives out as prostitutes to oh recoup gosh. that, that uh, fee. So they're not just in a forced marriage, but they're also forced into prostitution at the same time. It's barbaric. It's really unbelievable. I want to move on to a top, the topic of religious freedom. This is intertwined. Last week, the State Department issued its annual report on international religious freedom. Secretary of State Mike Pompeo said this of China. The Chinese Communist Party's exhibit extreme hostility to all religious faiths since its founding. The party demands that it alone be called God. That's why, in an effort to document the staggering scope of religious freedom abuses in Jiangjiang, we've added a special section to this year's China report. Hmm. The religious persecution in China, it's so bad that there, as you heard Pompeo say, there's a separate section for it in the report. Now, the Vatican signed a deal with the Chinese government in September, Reggie. Since then, churches and Marian shrines have been decimated. The persecution of Christians has even gotten worse. What's driving this? What is driving this oh. hatred of religion? <laughs> you, okay, if you're asking me what's driving the Vatican to sign that deal, I mean, I can't, I, I don't have any better answer than anyone mm -hmm. else. You know, what Pope Francis says is he's trying to unify the two churches of the underground church and the above ground church. But what's happened, in fact, is that because that deal is secret, the Chinese Communist Party has been using it to bludgeon the church, decimating churches, decimating Marian sh shrines, detaining priests. Uh, and, and I think that, that that deal, that what's the, the text of that deal should be made public so that people will be able to defend themselves. Because what the Chinese Communist Party does is they go and they say, your own pope told us that, you know, we should be able to do mm. this. And I have no doubt that, that Pope Francis and that that deal does not authorize the things that are going on. But the fact that it's secret leaves the people in China helpless. Yeah. Well, and in a moment when you're seeing these uprisings in Hong Kong, it, it, it would seem the perfect time for the church to stand strong and stand with the underground community that's been persecuted and tortured for uh, decades now. Now, Auxiliary Bishop Ignatius C. Wang of San Francisco, who was born in Beijing, said in an interview this week that given the circumstances of the Catholic Church in China, the deal with the Vatican is very good. He went on to say regarding the appointment of bishops, quote, the agreement acknowledges you have the last word, but we recommend. There are nearly 6,000 bishops in the world. How many would the Pope know personally? It has to be local as long as it is done conscientiously. I just hope it doesn't happen that they send bad ones on purpose for approval in Rome. He went on to say, regarding the persecution compared to the history of the church, this time is not worse than any other time. Your take, your response to that. 
Well, I think that, that the, the second to the last sentence of that is the most important one, where he says, I hope that they won't send bad right. ones to Rome on, on purpose. Of course they're going to send bad ones to Rome on purpose. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, but I, I have no trust whatsoever for the Chinese Communist Party. What they're going to do, and, and like Pompeo said, they view themselves as God, and they are going to, to offer three bishops, all of whom regard the Chinese Communist Party as God. And then Pope Francis, of course, can choose any one of them. But if you have three people who don't have any respect for the real church and the real, you know, and that Jesus Christ needs to be the head of the church and not the Chinese Communist Party, he's not going to have any good choices to choose from. Right. It's a recipe for disaster. What, what, what do you make of this, this notion that the persecution now is no different than it was in the past? Uh, <laughs> Struthius is the word, okay? He's got his head buried in the sand. Doesn't he read all the accounts of what's going on? Hasn't he seen all the, shri the Marian shrines that have stood for, for generations right. that are suddenly being torn down? Mm -hmm. I, you know, I, I guess I don't know, know where he gets his information or if he's getting information. I, mm. I, I just disagree with that. Reggie Littlejohn, as always, thank you for your candor and for your work, and we will stay in touch with you. You can find Reggie Littlejohn's work for the Women's Rights Without Frontiers at womenswrightswithoutfrontiers.org. Thanks again.